if you can't solve these three math questions, you're not getting an 800. So today, to better prepare you, I'll be going over some of the consensus hardest math problems to ever be administered on the SAT, so you can go from this to this. Now, before we get into the video, a lot of y'all in our comments section have been asking us, where do we get our questions from? Well, here it is, Prep Hub's very own AI-powered website where you can get access to over 300 hard and actually tested SAT math questions to boost your score. I know you're dying to learn more, so go ahead, go to our YouTube channel, click the link in our bio, open up that AI waitlist, and enter your email to get notified of everything you need to about this website. On to the video. All right, starting off with question number one. In this given equation right here, b is a positive integer. If qz to the 9 plus r is a factor of the expression, where q and r are positive integers, what is the greatest possible value of b? So looking at this question, we get three main things. We get that b is a positive integer, qz to the 9 plus r is a factor, and q and r are positive integers. So before we actually jump into factoring or anything complicated, let's just take a second to look at the structure of this expression we're given, since you know we don't really see equations like this that involve factoring. This is organized into a trinomial structure, right? You have term one, term two, and term three. Kind of like what you would see in a quadratic. But obviously the difference is in here, instead of dealing with x squared for your first term and x for your second, you're dealing with z to the 18 and z to the nine. So it seems like there isn't really a pattern between these two, but in fact there is. If you look at z to the nine, you can decipher that it's just the square root of z to the 18, just like x is going to be the square root of x squared. And if you looked at the c terms, right, like a quadratic, you have a constant number right here with no exponents attached to it. So basically, this is just like a quadratic trinomial, but instead of using single variable terms, they're using higher degree exponents. So if you wanted to like understand this better and paint a more clear picture in your head, what you could actually just do is you could substitute x for z to the 9. And so if you were to do that, the expression would just be 26x squared plus b x plus 70. And so now, since we can kind of see that it's a quadratic, so now we know that we have a quadratic equation essentially, and we have a factor pair of that quadratic equation. So if we were to revert back into the z terms, one of the factor pairs would be q z to the nine plus r. And I only need to find out one more factor pair because it's just like a binomial. And what I can do is, since I only need to do that, I can just create my own equivalence. I can just create my own factor pair using constants that I want to use. And then using those constants, I can work from there to get that greatest possible value of b. So I'll just call the second term right here. I'll just say s z to the 9, because we need to get to z to the 18, plus like a constant number t. Or instead of t, I'll do d. Okay. So now all this is going to foil out to this 26z to the 18 plus bz to the 9 plus 7t. So foiling this out, I would get qsz to the 18 plus qdz to the 9 plus rsc to the 9 plus rd. And then I can actually take this middle term right here and instead of dividing it into two terms I can take out a common factor of z to the 9 and then leave in 9d plus rs or qd plus rs and then these remain constant so and then all that equals this right here Okay, so next step, right? We basically have a foiled out version and then we have a simplified version. So what I can do is I can set these constants that I have on the left side equivalent to these actual variables and numbers that I have on the right side. So basically, qs z to the 18 and 26 z to the 18. That would just mean that q times s is going to be 26. And then you have bz, right? So that b, you have bz to the 9. So that b term would just be 9d plus rs. So b equals 9d plus rs. And then the c term, 70 equals rd. 
So this is what we're working with right now. And so basically, we want the greatest possible value of d. And if we want the greatest possible value of d, what we have to do is we have to max out qd in rs. So if I'm looking at q, right, the greatest factor pair I can get from qs, whatever the combination may be, is that one of these numbers has to be 26 and one of these numbers has to be 1. And for rd, same thing. One of these numbers has to be 70 and one of these numbers has to be 1. Like I could use 35 times 2 or you know, 13 times 2 for QS. But again, I want one to be maximized and one to be minimized. And that's because that's the only way you get this maximal value of B. So 70 times 1 and 26 times 1. Let's just say now, I'll say that Q is 26. And I'll say that S is 1. And then I'll say that R is um, 70 and D is 1. And let's just plug that into Q now. So, I mean, it's a B. So Q times D, 26 times 70, would be 2,000 or 1,820. And then 1 times 1, or R times S, is just going to be 1. So now I just have 1820 plus 1 as my greatest possible value of B. And so B is 1821. And you could try this with other smaller factor pairs, but you wouldn't get a greater value than 1821, which is why 1821 is going to be your final answer. Moving on to question number three. In the xy plane, a parabola has a vertex at 9 comma negative 14 and intersects the x-axis at two points. If the equation of the parabola is written in the form y equals ax squared plus bx plus c, where a, b, and c are constants, which of the following could be the value of a plus b plus c? So we don't know a lot of information in this question right here. We have to work with limited information to get to our conclusion. And that's why this question seems really complex for a lot of people. But it's just a lot of steps. It's not necessarily that these steps are super complex or really hard. But in order to work this question, we have to look at what's been provided. So we're told that the vertex is at 9 equal to negative 14. We're also told that this parabola intersects the x-axis at two points. So let's visualize that real quick. So let's just say that this is 9 and this is negative 14. That's going to be the vertex. And they're telling us that it has to touch the x-axis at two points. So it has to open upward, right? That's the only way that it touches at two points. But if a parabola opens upward, you know that your a value has to be positive. And this is crucial because prior to this, we didn't know if a was positive or negative. But now we know it opens upward, so a is positive. And the other thing it tells us is that we have this vertex right here. So using the vertex, we can actually write a parabola's equation in something called vertex notation. And so that is just going to be a times x minus h. In this case, h is the x coordinate of the vertex. So that'd be 9. All that squared. And then plus k, which is the y coordinate of the vertex. In this case, that's just negative 14. And so... Now I know that this right here is going to be equivalent to a x squared plus b x plus c. So I can so I can actually factor this out and set it equal to this equation right here. And so if I was to do that, I would get a times x minus nine times x minus nine, which would be a times x squared minus 18 minus 81. I'm going to distribute that A to give me AX squared minus 18AX minus 81A. And then you have your negative 14 at the end. So now we can compare our vertex form equation to AX squared plus BX plus C. So what we can do is we can match these terms right here. So we know that a equals a from right here and right here. b is going to equal negative 18a. And c is going to equal 81a minus 14. And so now 
we have all the variables just in terms of a and that's good because what we can do is we can just add a b and c to get everything in terms of a so a minus 18 a plus 81 a minus 14 and that's going to give us 64 a minus 14 so this is going to be the sum of everything i see on this left side right here so now we know that the value of a plus b plus c depends on whatever a is and we're told that the parabola intersects the x-axis at two points, so it opens upward, and therefore a must be greater than zero. So if I'm to look at all these answer choices, they're all negative, right? And so what I can do is I can actually set 64a minus 14 equal to all of them, and then wherever a is negative or not positive, I can just cross those answer choices out. So if I was to look back at the answer choices, it's negative 23 negative 19, negative 14, and negative 12. So plugging those in, starting off with negative 23. 64a minus 14 equals negative 23. I'm going to add 14. 64a equals negative 9. a would be negative. That wouldn't work out. And then for answer choice b, 64a minus 14 equals negative 19. Again, that would give me negative 5. 64a minus 14 equals. That would give me negative 5. And a, again, would be negative. And so that would not work as well. C. 64a minus 14 equals negative 14. If I add 14 to both sides, I get 64a equals 0. That's not negative, but that's not positive either. I would just have no parabola if a is 0. So c would be out as well. And that's going to leave me with d. 64a minus 14 equals negative 12. If I was to add 14 to both sides, then I get 64a equals 2. And I'd finally get some positive value for a. I don't even care to know what it is. I just know that the only value of a plus b plus c that's possible here is negative 12. All right, moving on to question number four. If n to the power of 5 thirds equals k to the power of 3 halves and 4, and n to the 4a plus 1 equals k, then what is a? So there are multiple ways to approach this question. Since you have isolate, k isolated already, what I can do is I can just take n to the 4a plus 1 and plug it into the k right here. And so then I'd be working with common bases and then I could solve for a from there. But I feel like that might be a little too complicated. So an easier way to do the same process is take this first equation right here and then isolate k right here. So if I was to isolate for k right here, I'd get k equals n to the power of something. And so then I could take this n to the power of something, plug it into k right here, and then set that equal to n to the power of 4a plus 1. And then at that point, since you'd be working with the common bases, you could set whatever's in the exponents equal to each other. So to illustrate that process, first I'd have to isolate for k right here. And in order to do that, I have to multiply both sides of the equation by the reciprocal of 3 over 2, because I want to isolate k. So if I was to do that, I'd get n to the power of 5 over 3 times 2 over 3, which is n to the power of 10 over 9, equals k to the power of 3 halves times 2 thirds, which is just k. And so n to the 10 over 9 equals k. So I'm going to take that and plug it in for this k over here. So now n to the power of 4a plus 1 equals n to the power of 10 over 9. Since you're working with common bases, you can set the exponents equal to each other. So 4a plus 1 is equivalent to 10 over 9. And then from here, it's just basic algebra. I'm going to subtract 1 from 10 over 9. So 1 in terms of 9 is going to be 9 over 9. So 4a equals 10 over 9 minus 9 over 9. That's just 4a equals 1 over 9. And I want to get rid of this 4 right here. The way I'm going to do that is I'm going to multiply everything by 1 over 4. And so that would just give me a equals 1 ninth times 1 fourth, which is 1 over 36. And that's going to be your final answer.